going to invite you to take a seat and grab your Bible or your Bible app and turn to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4 is our text. And uh, if you're in the room and you don't have a Bible with you, that's fine. Grab one of the Bibles in the seats around you and turn to page 1,166 and you will find Philippians 4. You'll be able to follow along with us uh, if you choose to. And, uh, and as always, if you're here and you do not have a Bible and you want one, please take one of those with you because we want you to have the Bible and read the Bible. And if you're joining us from home uh, and you're watching and you do not have a Bible and you want one, please let us know because while you can't just take one with you, we can send one to you uh, we, or we can deliver one to you, whatever is easier. And we want you and everyone to have the Word of God, read the Word of God, because we know that if you read and apply God's Word... God will change your life. Hey, uh, who wants more joy in their life? Okay, I'm curious why everyone didn't raise their hand. Okay, is there anybody here that's too happy? It's like, I really need something to depress me because I am way too happy. I've got too much joy. Could you bring me down a few notches? You know, I don't think I've ever uh, thought that because we all pursue happiness. We all pursue fun. We all pursue joy. I mean, after all, it's in our Declaration of Independence. It's like it's our American birthright, right? Thomas Jefferson wrote back in 1776, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights that among these are life, liberty, and what? Yeah, the pursuit of happiness. So how's that pursuit going for you? How's that pursuit going for you? Because I ask because joy sometimes seems like it's in short supply. And I don't think it's, be it's because of a pandemic or a disruption in the supply chain or government policies. Uh, and, and predating the Declaration of Independence by about 1,700 years, the Apostle Paul declared that joy is part of our birthright as followers of Jesus. So if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, if you believe that Jesus is the one and only Son of God and Savior of the world, and you believe that he died on the cross to pay for your sins, and you believe Jesus was raised from the dead, and you have made a commitment to follow Jesus with your life, then joy is your birthright. It, 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 you're, you, we're expected, we're commanded to be a people of joy. So how are you doing with that pursuit? You see, today I want us to look at this command and at least one of the obstacles, one of the things that gets in the way of us having joy, if you will, one of the joy killers that is inhibiting us from living a life with more joy in it. Philippians chapter 4, uh, verses 2 through 4 is all I'm reading this evening. The Apostle Paul says, I entreat Euodia and Syntyche, or Syntyche, or you can pronounce it however you want to. I don't care. Okay? Because none of you are named this name, right? <laughs> if you're reading that, if you're not reading it, you're like, what are you talking about? Look it up. It's really weird. Okay? Uh, I entreat Euodia and Syntyche to agree in the Lord. Yes, I ask you also, true companion, help these women who have labored side by side with me in the gospel together with Clement and the rest of my fellow workers whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Now, first thing I got to mention is, aren't you glad your names aren't written in the Bible for being troublemakers? Aren't you glad that you weren't there with the Apostle Paul so that he could name you as being a couple of people who couldn't get along? So that for all of the rest of the time, if people read the Bible, they're like, yeah, you know what he did in If that's how you pronounce yeah, we'll meet her in heaven. We'll meet them both in heaven. And we'll be like, okay, so what were you guys fighting about? Oh, sorry, is, is that awkward? It won't be awkward, okay? Just tell you, nothing will be awkward in heaven. Uh, so, uh, but, I mean, we're going to meet them. And, and here's the thing. They did not get along to the point where they were disrupting a church. Their conflict, their disunity, their disagreement actually escalated to the point of getting in the way of the mission so much that the Apostle Paul named them 2,000 years ago. Isn't that crazy? 
And we're talking about it today, and I don't know about you, but we probably are really, really thankful that we're not in the Bible as the people who were having problems getting along. And, and see, here's the thing. We have no idea what the conflict was about. We have no idea what they were fighting about. We're fairly certain it wasn't about doctrine because the Apostle Paul addressed doctrinal issues in so many of his letters. Even in, in Philippians, he talked about doctrine. He called out people for false doctrine and false teachings on a regular basis. So we don't think it was about doctrine. And it probably wasn't, uh, you know, about the, the form of worship and how to worship and do stuff like that because he talked about that in several of his letters. It probably wasn't about morality issues because he called people out for morality issues in several of his letters. So what was the conflict? We really don't know. Maybe it was about who gets to make the decision, what color the carpet's going to be. See, we took care of that here at Calvary. We just don't have carpet. We just, like, polish the concrete. That's good. No argument there. Or maybe they were arguing about whether we should have live or fake flowers. We took care of that one, too. We don't have any flowers. So, see, we just removed the arguments. So now people are going, can't we have flowers? Uh, so, you know, the conflict. Who makes the decision? Maybe they were arguing about who gets the credit. You know, I was the one who did that. Oh, no, I was the one who did that. Maybe they were arguing about whose picture is better. I mean, we had a ladies paint night uh, this week with like 87 ladies there. And uh, yeah, it was kind of cool. Maybe they got in an argument about whose painting was better. I don't know. Could happen. Let's make everyone vote. No, that's a bad idea. Maybe that one lady, you know, Yodia, she was in charge of the nursery and she disciplined, whatever you say her name, uh, her child. And, and she didn't like the fact that she disciplined her child the way that she disciplined her child. And the next thing you know, they got a church fight. See, we don't know what it was, but there was conflict. And it was significant. And immediately after addressing the conflict, immediately after saying to the church, help these women get along what does Paul say? Rejoice in the Lord always. In fact, because we're kind of dense as people, let me say it again. Rejoice. Can I just tell you why I think the, the apostle followed that conversation about conflict with the words about joy? Because unresolved conflict is a joy killer. It's a joy killer. You see, God wants your life full of joy. God wants your life to be joyful. You may not realize that. That may be a shocking truth for you. That may be something you've never heard preached in the world before, but God wants your life to be full of joy. Jesus said in John 15, These things I have spoken to you, that my joy may be in you, and that your joy may be full or complete. Jesus said, I want you to have complete joy. I've given you my joy so that your joy can be complete. I think that's kind of cool. That's Jesus talking to his followers. The Apostle Paul in Galatians said, hey, the fruit of the Holy Spirit being in you is love. You guys know what the next one, second one is? Joy. Yeah, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. But joy is one of the fruit of the Holy Spirit. God says, if the Holy Spirit is in you and you're giving him control of your life, there's going to be joy. And then Paul commands, commands, rejoice in the Lord always. I'm going to say it again, rejoice. You see, God designed you to live a joyful life. And again, I could say, how's that working out for you? Joy is so significant because joy is such an appealing and attractive quality. Look, our mission as a church is to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Okay? We want to lead people to a life-changing relationship with Jesus. And can I tell you that one of the most attractive qualities that will draw people to Jesus in a world that is angry, outraged, frustrated, uh, despairing, is people who are living authentic joy. Okay, that, that is one of the most appealing things, that when other people are going, isn't the world terrible, and we're singing a song going, God's in control, and we win. And unresolved conflict kills that joy. Now, I've been in a lot of churches in my years. Can I just tell you that churches excel in unresolved conflict? And churches are flush with joyless people. 
okay? I mean, they're being faithful. They're showing up. They're like, okay, God, we're here. We want it to be good, but it's not. And people are mad at each other, and they're arguing, and there's fighting, and there's gossiping, and there's talking about this stuff. And, and it's just crazy. And we get offended, okay? This is all of us. We get offended because of pride. C.S. Lewis said pride is the great sin. It's, it's part of all of our lives. All of us have pride. Uh, and, and so we get offended because, hey, you owe me respect. You owe me an apology. We start demanding other people give us something. You owe me. Or we think, I deserve to be treated better. Our friends tell us, he had no right to speak to you that way. She had no right to speak to you that way. Who do they think they are? Or we get offended because you should listen to my idea. You should do it my way, right? Because my way is brilliant. If you guys would just do it my way, you'd see. Or we just get offended because I didn't get my way. I didn't get my way, so I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm upset, and, and I want those around me to be hurt and angry and upset too. Because I want to get my way. So we get offended. Which, by the way, it seems to be the popular thing to do right now, doesn't it? Yeah, we get offended and so we get angry. We get outraged. And then we justify our anger. You made me angry. You, if you hadn't done this, I wouldn't have lost control and I wouldn't be angry and all this kind of stuff. So we justify our anger and then we practice unforgiveness. And if you practice unforgiveness, it becomes bitterness and rage and anger and all that stuff grows up inside of you. And this is the death spiral for joy. This is a death spiral for joy. Joy cannot exist in an angry, bitter, unforgiving heart. You're not going to be joyful and angry and unforgiving at the same time. It's not possible. Just can't work. Now, you can fake joy. <laughs> I've been in a lot of churches where they did that. Put on the plastic smiles, act like everything's okay so they can get close to you and stab you in the back. Uh, it's all good. <laughs> so you can fake joy, but it's easy to see it. And um, by the way, it's ugly. It's really ugly. It makes people want to run away. And yet we live angry and offended lives and wonder why there's no joy. Let me say it again. We live angry and offended lives and wonder why there's no joy. So here's the really, really good news. Grace results in joy. Grace results in joy. When you know that God has forgiven all your sin, when you know even though you're guilty, you've been pardoned by Jesus, when you are aware that you absolutely and unequivocally deserve to go to hell. And yet, because of Jesus' sacrifice for you, you've got a one-way ticket to heaven. Amen. When you understand that you uh, are, are a child of God, when you rejected God, when you defied God, when you rebelled against God, and yet he pursued you and said, I want you to be my son, my daughter, in my kingdom forever and ever, then you cannot help but rejoice. Hey, is there anybody here who's excited about grace? Yeah. See, I like that. We ought to be excited about grace. I, at least I think we ought to be excited about grace. I think you guys will do the best. I think the other, the other services will be too sleepy tomorrow. They'll just like sleep right through that. Online, I hope you guys made some noise at your house too. If you didn't, let me give online another chance, okay? Like, see, so you guys need to make some noise. We'll all be listening, okay? All right, is, is anyone online excited about grace? No, okay, all right, people are faking it for you in here, okay? <laughs> You see, receiving grace results in joy. Let me say that again. Receiving the grace of God results in joy. And look, there are those of you that could testify right now if I gave you the opportunity. I'm not. But if I gave you the opportunity, you guys could come up here and you could say, hey, look, here's my life before I met Jesus. I was angry. I was upset. I was frustrated all the time. And Jesus took that away, and I'm a whole different person now. Okay, look, there's some of you, that's your testimony, and you've lived it, and there's people who go, what happened to them? And your family and, and old friends keep thinking you're, you're going to screw it up again, and you're going to become that angry person again. Receiving grace results in joy, and giving grace results in joy. 
Okay, we love the receiving grace part, but can I just tell you that giving grace results in joy? It doesn't result in joy when you get your way. It doesn't result in joy when you exact revenge. There's no joy in winning the argument or receiving an apology. Okay? Th those do not lead to joy. Satan wants you to think they lead to joy. He wants you to hold out for revenge. He wants to hold out for an apology. Yeah, when they come groveling on their knees, then. Yeah, no. Giving grace. Giving grace to other people who have wronged you results in joy. After all, Jesus modeled forgiveness. The people who had tortured him, beaten him, and were in the process of executing him, and people who were mocking him, who had arranged all this, Jesus prayed, Father, forgive them. They don't know what they're doing. He modeled it. Jesus taught forgiveness. I think you guys know this, right? You can say it with me if you do. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our... Yeah. Okay, wait. How many of you are debtors? And how many of you are trespassers? Okay, see, it's about split. It's about even. Sorry. I grew up debtors. So, you know, for those of you that grew up trespassers, just go ahead and interpret. <laughs> Look, we, pr we know how to pray this. Jesus taught us to pray this. You might say that, you know, the Lord's Prayer just mindlessly, and yet you're asking God to forgive you the same way you forgive others. He taught us to forgive. Paul echoes Jesus. Ephesians chapter 4, he says, hey, all of you that are followers of Jesus, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as God in Christ Jesus has forgiven you. Okay, I don't know if you guys understand this or not, but in Christ Jesus, God forgives you everything. Everything. I know, that is so cool. And, it's, and it just is. I mean, we ought to be so excited about this. And, and this is why it's so important that we give grace to other people because this is what followers of Jesus do. And when we do it, it results in joy. Both receiving and giving joy are necessary, or giving grace are necessary for joy. Let me say that again. Both receiving grace and giving grace are necessary for joy to happen in your life. See, some of you are really good at receiving grace. Yeah, I like the fact God's forgiven me, but you need some work on forgiving other people. You're holding on to the anger and the unforgiveness. Some of you are really good at, at forgiving other people, but you're not really good at receiving the grace of God, and you're still feeling guilty about the stuff you've done, even though God says, I've wiped it clean. You need both. You need to open up and say, God, I deserve hell. You've given me heaven. I'm yours. Thank you. And celebrate that. And then you need to look at the people around you and say, I forgive you. Whether they ask for forgiveness or not. Just give grace. Because Philippians 4 is not an option. Rejoice in the Lord. When? Because like, you were dense. I'm going to say it again. Rejoice. Yeah, see, we, we rejoice. We, we just keep rejoicing. By the way, it, Paul was even blunter, if that's possible, more direct, in 1 Thessalonians 5, because he just goes, rejoice always, period. That's just it. Just rejoice always. Just do it. Look, it's, it's not an option. It's not something that Jesus is recommending. It's not something that he's kind of like, no, this is like, you guys need to do this. Rejoice in the Lord always. And, and grace is the pathway to joy. Giving grace, receiving grace. And, and this is where it gets difficult. And I know this is where it gets difficult. So let's talk about steps to rejoice. Steps to rejoice. Because rejoicing is a choice. Okay? To rejoice is a choice. You're making a decision to do this. You go, well, I want to feel happy. I want to feel... Can I just tell you that God does not command us to feel anything? He commands us to act. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. You decide that you're going to be patient and kind toward people. You don't feel like being patient and kind toward people. Right? Some of you don't feel anything until like after about 11 o'clock in the morning and like, like half a gallon of coffee. 
You know, you like, commit murder that early in the morning. You're just like, yeah, get out of my way. No, but you choose to love people anyway. You're never going to feel like loving your enemies, and yet Jesus tells us to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us so that we may be sons of our Father in heaven. So, you know, this is what it looks like to be Christ followers, to be Jesus people, is to forgive. And so it's also to rejoice. So if unresolved conflict kills our joy and grace results in joy and we are told to always rejoice and all of us want joy in our lives, then how do we get there? I'm going to give you two practical steps, two practical habits that you need to make the decision to do these. And by the way, these are not a once and done. These are like, I'm going to do these forever from now on in my life. I'm never going to stop doing these because I want to be a person of joy. And the more you practice these, the more that you in incorporate them in your life, then the more joyful you're going to become until you don't even realize that you're doing it and joy is just flooding in your life. Okay, this is how this works. The first thing you need to do is forgive. He said, yeah, you already, already talked about that. We mentioned it already about giving grace, and we ought to do that. We know we're supposed to do that. I'm, it's not talking about knowledge. This is talking about practice. I know that everyone who's a follower of Jesus knows that they're supposed to forgive. That, that's, that's easy. Forgiving is hard. Forgiving is hard. So you've got to make a decision to be obedient to Jesus and say, I am going to forgive. Okay? This, this person who offended me, I'm going to forgive. I'm deciding to forgive. I'm committing to forgive radically and continually, God. You've told me to forgive. I'm going to forgive. So forgive whomever you need to forgive. Whomever you're angry at, whoever has offended you, whoever has let you down. So if you need to forgive Trump for being Trump, forgive him. Okay? If you need to forgive Biden for being president, forgive him. Okay? If you need to forgive your ex-spouse, forgive them your former business partner, your boss who treats you like a jerk all the time and didn't give you the raise he promised, your friend who betrayed you, your family who has hurt you and let you down and beat you up for, for decades. Forgive them. Okay, so how are we supposed to forgive? How can you forgive? This is where it gets crazy practical. I'm just gonna tell you what works in my life, what works biblically, and then you gotta do it. And you gotta keep doing it. First of all, if you wanna forgive, you gotta pray for them. Jesus said, you've heard it said, love your neighbor and hate your enemy, but I say to you, love your enemy and pray for those who persecute you. Love your enemy, pray for those who persecute you, which means if you're angry at somebody, you need to put them at the top of your prayer list and you need to pray for them. And the prayer does not need to be, God, drop a rock on their head. <laughs> the prayer does not need to be, God, give them explosive diarrhea in a traffic jam. See, I know what you guys are thinking. You're all thinking, that would be perfect. I'm going to pray for that. No, don't pray for that. You know what you pray for your enemies, for those who've hurt you? For the person you're angry at? You pray that God would bless them. You pray that God would reveal himself to them, that he'd fill their life with so much love and joy and peace that they would recognize God and they'd be drawn close to him. And, and I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I don't really want them to experience that. This is not about what they experience. This is about what you experience. So if you want joy, you say, okay, Jesus, I'm going to obey you. I don't feel like it. And when you pray it the first time, guess what? You won't even mean it. <laughs> you're not going to mean it. Because you're wanting the rock on their head or the traffic jam thing. But you're going to grit your teeth and you're going to do it because you want to be that child of God and we're supposed to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us. So you're going to start praying for them and, and you're going to do it every day and you're going to keep saying, okay, God, bless them and, and show your love to them and let them have peace. And you know what's going to happen is one day, weeks, months, years, decades later, I don't know how long it's going to take you, you're going to pray for them and you know what? You're not going to feel any anger or any hatred or any bitterness in your heart and you're gonna have forgiven them, completely. So that when you see them on the street, or someone brings up their name, your blood pressure doesn't go up and there isn't a knot in your stomach. Forgiveness, yeah, it's a process. You decide to do it, and then you start praying for them, and, it, and, and God starts working out. Now some of you are like, I've been doing that, I need some more help, great, get counseling. 
Seriously, go get counseling. Talk through the issues with somebody. Hopefully somebody who shares your faith and can give you a, a Christian perspective on what that looks like. But, but find somebody to talk to about that. They're going to tell you what I'm telling you just in different ways, okay? Uh, and then if that isn't enough or if that isn't where the route you want to go, then get involved in a 12-step program. We got Celebrate Recovery Monday nights right here at 630. You go, well, how's that going to help me? Well, see, that's why you need it right there, because you don't know. And, but, but here's the thing. If you're doing a 12-step, you have to get honest with yourself. And if you're unforgiven or towards somebody, you're going to have to mention that. And at some point, you're going to have to forgive them and make amends and do all this kind of stuff. And, and, and it's wonderful. It's healing. But it's basically doing what I said on the prayer thing, only in a group of people who are going to hold you accountable. Now, you're going, that's too easy. No, it isn't. It's extremely practical. It's hard work, but you actually have to do it. And if you don't do it, you won't find joy because you won't get to forgiveness. You just have to keep faking it. And we all know that doesn't really work. So, that's how you forgive. If you want to authentically rejoice, it requires forgiving. And then you have to decide to live preemptive grace. Preemptive grace. In other words, decide to forgive before you're even offended. Okay, let me say that again. I want you, God wants you, decide that you're going to be that person who, who's going to forgive before anyone even offends you. Uh, this is living counter-cultural. This is being a rebel against our crazy, angry world right now. Because I don't know if you guys have noticed this or not, but many people seem to live looking for offense. I mean, we're in the midst of outrage culture. People are outraged about everything, trying to cancel people. And, and by the way, this isn't new. It's just magnified. It's, the outrage culture has been around for, forever because it's sin. It's people getting offended because of pride or because they want power or control or whatever. And so they try to control what other people do by outrage and by anger. That is not new. It's been around for thousands of years. But with social media now, it gets magnified, okay? Still, sin is sin. And, and outrage is outrage, and it, does, it never leads to joy. So, uh, so here's the thing. Live counterculturally. Be the opposite. Be difficult to offend. Stop living with that chip on your shoulder and looking for, uh, you know, being able to read everything into everything. Now, by the way, being difficult to offend does not mean you're clueless. It just means you're graceful. You have to overlook a lot of stuff. But here's what it means. If you're going to do this, if you're going to live preemptive grace, it means giving everyone in your life the benefit of the doubt. Okay? Give everyone the benefit of the doubt. Give your spouse the benefit of the doubt. Give your kids the benefit of the doubt. I know, as parents, we're just so quick to judge, aren't we? Give them the benefit of the doubt. Give your siblings the benefit of the doubt. Wait, here's this. Give your in-laws the benefit of the doubt. Okay? Seriously. If you're going to do this, you have to start going, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give people the benefit of the doubt, which means that you interpret, you decide to interpret every single conversation, every text, email, and message you receive in the most positive way possible. Have you ever noticed how we easily read negative things into black and white print? Am I the only one who does that? Am I the only one capable of doing that, or do you guys want to confess too? No, see, we do that. We read it, and we, oh, do you hear what they're saying? And if people have done that, look, listen to what they said to me. And I read it, and I go, that ah, just looks like words. I think you're reading something into this. Yeah, we do that. So if you can read into it, you can read out of it. Right? This is a choice we're making. It's a choice you're making. It is not something that is done to you. It is something you are choosing to do. So you decide to listen with ears of grace, to read with eyes of grace, to interact with people with grace. And, and you may or may not, they, look, they may be trying to offend you. Just be difficult to offend. Okay? Be difficult to offend. Like, you can offend me, but you're going to have to get really obvious to do it. Like, uh, over the top, obvious to do it. It's not going to be easy to like, I, I accidentally offended. No, you got to try. Okay? You got to try hard. 
Some of you are like, okay, challenge accepted. <laughs> but you can live that way. Look, just understand that usually it's not personal. Okay, tell yourself, it's not, per look at the person next to you and tell them it's usually not personal. Okay? It's not. Think about it. Think about all the times that you decide to take it personal when it's really not personal. When that car cuts you off or when they slow, drive slow in the left lane, it is not personal. Okay? It is not. They got something else on their mind. You know, somebody didn't teach them how to drive. It's okay. It's not personal. When, when, look, when your server is late getting to your table, when they commit the unpardonable sin of waiting on somebody who got seated after you, before you, it's not personal. Okay, they just got confused. I didn't see you, whatever. Just, some of you are like, you lose it right there and then. It's like World War III, we gotta like, hang somebody. If they bring the wrong food to your table, or if they you know, get the order wrong, it's not personal. Look, when somebody forgets to tell you about an event to, or invite you to a party or something like that, okay, it might be personal, but don't take it personal, <laughs> okay? See, that's what it means to live with preemptive grace is you don't have to take it personal. You, you, listen, did you hear that? You do not have to take it personal. You do not have to be offended by every little thing out there. You can just live preemptively with grace. I'm gonna give grace before you're an idiot. That's fine. Wait a minute, isn't that what God did with us? It's exactly what God did with us. It kind of means... Uh, living, I, I like this picture, so, I, yeah, because I'm a nerd, kind of like means living with a grace shield. Some of you are Captain America fans, you know, he's got that really cool shield that blocks everything. What if we just lived with a grace shield? And all the offenses that people would supposedly hurl at us just die on that shield of grace. And they don't get through to steal our joy, to ruin our day, to, to make things ugly for our family? What if we just live that way, like this force field of mercy that is around us? Now see, some of you like this idea, but you're kind of thinking, where do I start? Okay, again, it's a discipline of repetition. So it starts when you focus on how God has forgiven you. You gotta remind yourself all the time how God has forgiven you completely, sacrificially, abundantly, limitlessly. I mean, he just does, and when you keep remembering how Jesus died for your sins, how he suffered for you, how he has given you life when you deserve death. I mean, then it, it changes your attitude about other people because you're a sinner just like they are. And then you gotta focus on being grateful. Let me say that again. You need to focus on being grateful. When you're grateful, the world shines. You gotta, but you gotta see the blessings that our lives are filled with. I think a lot of Christians, their uh, spiritual disability is that they're blind to blessings. Can I just say that? I think a lot of us have a spiritual disability where we're blind to blessings and we can't see them and because we can't see them, we don't count them. Because we don't count them, we don't remember them. And because we don't remember them, we live our lives ungrateful. And if you're ungrateful, you're gonna be unmerciful because you think that you're owed something. Can you look and see how blessed you are? I mean, look, if you got nothing at all, but you live in the United States of America, you're blessed more than about 80% of the world. Okay? I mean, you're already winning. So you won the lottery of history. You're living in America, 21, or whatever year it is, 2021. And, uh, and, and even with all the crazy stuff that's gone on, you're still blessed. You're still blessed. So be grateful. So focus on how much God has forgiven you. Be grateful. And then finally... You gotta be a blessing to other people. Look, if you're gonna live preemptive grace, the focus has to stop being on you and how you're being offended, and it's gotta be turned outward so that you focus on other people and how you can bless them, how you can serve them, how you can help them, how you can encourage them, how you can be generous towards them. And if you do that, you'll be amazed at how less offensive the world is and you won't have all those joy killers filling your life because that conflict that steals joy isn't there. Now, you might be a long way from getting there or you might be pretty close to getting there, 
but if you'll walk this road, if you'll take this process, if you'll follow those steps and you'll do it over and over and over again, it'll work. It'll work. See, this is the truth. If you choose to rejoice, if you choose to forgive, if you choose to live with preemptive grace, your life really will be full of joy. So the choice is yours. You can live angry and offended, or you can live rejoicing in the Lord always. I choose joy. Let's pray. God, it's amazing how good you have been to us. It ama it's amazing how you have loved us, how you've saved us, how you've changed our lives, how you've redeemed our, our sins and, and set us on solid ground so that we can serve the living God with our lives. And Lord, we just confess that a lot of times we complain, we whine, we gripe, we're ungrateful and, and we're angry and offended and we wanna repent and we wanna hold on to you and, and your grace and your mercy. We wanna receive it because we need it and we wanna give it like we never have before. So Father, teach us how to do this. Teach us how to be those people who represent Jesus at that point of grace so that we can rejoice always. Lord, we love you. Thanks for giving us a reason to celebrate. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.